we've been modifying genes, not by gene editing, but by selective breeding from the beginning. How else can you turn a wolf into a chihuahua, into a lap poodle? That's what we've been doing. We just know how to do it better today than ever before, faster than ever before. What I find interesting about CRISPR and its applications is how widespread it can become. It doesn't require large labs or large sums of money. So in a sense, it democratizes gene editing. And I have no idea where that will go. Uh, are we wise enough to tame ourselves in the presence of this awesome power that previously was only in the hands of nature? Only in the hands of nature over millennia, and in some cases, millions of years. And now you can do it over a weekend with a kit modifying organisms. Biology is still being transformed by CRISPR technologies. I don't know where it's going to land, but I know there's a huge upside for the good that it could bring us all. And let's just hope our culture, our scientists, our institutions are wise enough to get us there. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching. Hi, this is Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio, here live from Australia Down Under with James Jacob Prash, and this is This Week in Prophecy. Blessings from... Brisbane, Australia. Happy to be with you. Praise the Lord Jesus. Our apologies for the technical glitches we had last week and last week's This Week in Prophecy. The uh, signaling was very bad in, in Sydney and internet and Wi-Fi for some reason are not as good in Australia and New Zealand as they are in the rest of the developed world. I don't know why that is, but that is the way it is. In any event, let's move on to This Week in Prophecy. As usual, we'll begin in the Middle East. But in Washington and in New York, John Bolton, former UN ambassador to UN, a conservative uh, news commentator, challenged the Trump administration's report to Congress that Iran is in compliance with the Obama-John Kerry deal. We will stand up to the United States. That from Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. Today, promising his country is not afraid of the Trump administration. The remarks come just one day after the White House issued new sanctions on Iran for, quote, breaking the spirit of the nuclear deal. Those sanctions were announced the day after President Trump reluctantly certified Iran's compliance with the nuke deal for the second time as a candidate. He vowed to rip up the controversial deal, but his administration has shied away from such action, arguing the United States should live up to its word. But my next guest says it's time for the president to scrap the Iran deal and put the safety of the American people first. It's former ambassador to the U.N. and Fox News contributor, Ambassador John Bolton. Welcome back, sir. Glad to be with you. Uh, I actually agree with you. I think this is a, a bad deal, and it was one of the things shocker, that I was... Shocker, shocker. <laughs> I know. It was one of the things that uh, I was most uh, intrigued by when the president talked about it on the campaign trail, because he seemed to be genuinely sickened by the Iran nuclear deal. Does he have the power to do what you and I would like him to do? Yes, absolutely. I, I think what we've seen in this recent flap over uh, certification and the one 90 days before that when it first came up is the strength of the bureaucracy convincing uh, some of his appointees that there's no other option except to certify. His instincts are right, and yeah. I hope, uh, although we've just passed this one, by the time the next 90-day certification comes up, I think this deal may be headed to the ash heap of history. All right, well, let's talk about that a little bit, because it, it seems like the administration is trying to have it both ways, and that happens with both parties and all presidents. Uh, you know, they, they certify the deal. They say that Iran is being compliant but at the same time violating the spirit of the deal. What does that mean? 
Well, I don't think it means anything, uh, actually. And I think this is what happens when, uh, uh, when you see the bureaucracy digging in like this. Let, let's just take the argument you mentioned a moment ago that the United States would be somehow violating its commitment. Look, this deal is contrary to American strategic interest. I think it's clear the Iranians have been violating it. Uh, and, and I think it's also clear we don't know nearly the extent of the violations. I absolutely. think you absolutely you're absolutely right about that. that. And, and they're they're not they're not uh, the the international community does not have access to the kind of inspections I think based on what I've read that would be required for compliance here. Will we ever yeah. be in a position in order to to really inspect the facilities and the work that's going on in that country? No, look, the deal itself actually weakens the, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency's ability to find out what's going on. But let, let's cut to the chase. Wh whether, we, whether we can know it one way or another, if the president concludes this deal is bad for the American people, if it endangers us, he should scrap it. The same way George W. Bush got us out of the 1972 anti-ballistic missile treaty so we could build a missile defense system, the same reason Bush got us out of the International Criminal Court Treaty. I, I don't really care what what international opinion is. If it's bad for the American people, the president should withdraw from it. Well, that also seems to be the mood of the American public. There's also a lot about this deal, not just the inspections. There's a lot about this deal uh, that still remains a mystery. Uh, and it, it's one of those things, and I'm going to talk about this a little later in the show, that was crafted to be so complex it's actually more difficult to extricate ourselves from it. And, and I think that is, uh, that is the hallmark of some of these Obama legacy deals. No, I think that's exactly right. Look, the, the deal is so favorable to Iran uh, that, that, in fact, that's one of the arguments that the State Department and others have used to stay in it. Well, we've already given them $150 billion and lifted the sanctions. What, what else is there to do? Yeah. I think Obama understood exactly what he was doing. I think the Iranians sent, uh, set up an economic honey trap to induce the Europeans and American companies to yeah. come into it, figuring we'd never have the courage to get out. Then, then we elected Donald Donald Trump, which is why I still think we're going to get out of it. All right, last question. We only have about 10 seconds left. If you were Secretary of State, would you have been able to convince the president to tear it up on his first day in office? I don't think he needs convincing. I think he's ready to go. I think we should have done exactly that. Too much bureaucracy. You and I agree about that as well. Ambassador, thank you That's very for much sure. for your time. It was completely unconstitutional, completely illegal, and has no bearing or standing in law and that only the Senate can approve treaties. Mr. Bolton has urged the Trump administration to junk the Obama concordance with Iran. He's given an impressive list of violations. Now, the Trump administration has indeed taken a stand concerning Iran's development of delivery systems, that is, a missile-based delivery systems for medium to long range weapons. And there are new sanctions being put in place as we talked about last week on This Week in Prophecy. Mr. Bolton, however, has effectively and quite impressively and quite convincingly challenged the reports made by the Trump administration. I do not know what the reasons are. They may be strategic. It may be a one at a time step. Mr. Trump and his defense team, National Security Council, may be wishing to first concentrate on the Iranian development of ballistic missile systems capable of delivering weapons of mass destruction before they address the weapons of mass destruction themselves. But certainly, uh, enhancement of visual materials has accelerated in Iran, among other developments. Secondly, Congress has imposed, or is attempting to impose, new sanctions against Russia based on Russian interference in the American electoral process and other considerations. Mr. Trump will either have to sign this or he will have to use his powers to veto it. If he vetoes it, however, he'll be going against his own base in Congress, not just the Republican base, but the conservative base who is more sympathetic to him. Uh, there is a lot of anger among the constituencies concerning Russia's activities. And although there is absolutely no evidence of any real collusion between the Trump campaign 
and the Russians, there is sufficient evidence, if not proof, of Russian interference in the American electoral system. Now, there is a hypocrisy in this. It would be foolish to think that America does not do the same thing. Nonetheless, that remains the reality. It does show to a worsening relationship between the United States and Russia. This week in prophecy, Mr. Putin has concorded an agreement with Syria to have a 50-year lease on the Russian air base that exists in Latakia in Syria, with an option to extend for an additional 25 years. This is the biggest reassertion of Russian power since the Cold War, when the Soviets had operational units in Syria. Uh, of course, if the Assad regime were to fall, this would change the equation. But as it is, the Russians now have a fully operational air base in Syria. This is going to be very interesting, not just in light, light of any possible future Gog and Magog scenarios, but in light of what will transpire in the nearer term. The base will contain not just support aircraft or reconnaissance aircraft, but actual fighter aircraft, capable of hitting targets almost anywhere in the Middle East, including Israel. Now, we're reminded in the war of attrition, there was already dogfights, aerial dogfights, between the Israeli Air Force and the former Soviet Air Force, in which the Israelis made virtual monkeys out of the Russian pilots flying their mates. The Israelis successfully downed a string of Soviet fighter jets in the war of attrition back in the 1970s. Are we being pushed back towards that scenario again, or one that is similar to it? That is the question. Further afield, in Pakistan, the Pakistan judiciary has ruled that the Prime Minister, Nawaz Sharif, who replaced General Musharraf, cannot run for election again due to the criminal investigations of him and his family. The court also removed the finance minister, Ishaq Dar. The corruption in Pakistan is endemic, endemic. Now what's important is this. They represent an Islamic party, but not a radical Islamic party, they represent the Pakistan Muslim League. If a more radical faction ever takes over, you're going to have a radical Islamic regime with a nuclear arsenal. This pushes the prospect of a nuclear confrontation with India ever closer. It is something to keep an eye on. Something else to keep an eye on is this. Western intelligence, the State Department, the Pentagon, the British are increasingly concerned, as are the Israelis, about the longer-term stability of the Hashemite regime of King Abdullah of Jordan. He's been forced to make various political concessions to Islamic factions in his country and to the Palestinians, remembering that Yasser Arafat claimed that Jordan was Palestine, and King Abdullah's father, King Hussein, said that Palestine was Jordan back in 1970. Well, in light of the history of Black September, when the Jordanian Legion massacred between 15 and 18,000 of Yasser Arafat's terrorist gunmen way back then, when they attempted to seize control of Jordan, we can see the prospects of what may lie ahead. If this were to happen, if his regime was to become unsustainable, Bearing in mind, he's a Hashemite, he's Saudi Arabian, ethnically, from a Saudi Arabian Bedouin tribe, same tribe as Mohammed, their so-called prophet, that his minority government, uh, if it lost power, you'd have an ascendancy of a Palestinian regime that could indeed be radically Islamic, or something along the lines of the Palestinian Authority with a nation state and a war machine on back of it. This could very easily lead to the prophecies in Isaiah of Amman to be destroyed. As we pointed out repeatedly, the Isaiah 17 prophecy about 
Damascus is coming to structure. And of Amman in Jordan has never historically transpired, but must transpire before the Lord comes. The state of Jordan is more precarious than anyone lets on. It always has been to a degree. When Saddam Hussein in 1991 invaded Kuwait, King Hussein of Jordan, although normally an ally of the West, particularly of American Britain, opposed the American and British drive to force Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait and to invade southern Iraq. He actually opposed it. His position is always precarious. The precariousness of the Hashemite government in Jordan was seen last week, in this week in prophecy. The Jordanians took the side of the Waqf, complaining that the Israelis had installed metal detectors following the Islamic attacks on Israeli policemen on the Temple Mount. Of course, this is utterly hypocritical in that the Hajj in Mecca has metal detectors, as do a number of other Islamic shrines. Nonetheless, why did Jordan pander this element? Well, because the situation is more precarious than the media are reporting, or than Western governments would like to acknowledge. But there is something eventually going to erupt in Jordan. Pay attention, watch this space. Whether it will be another Black September, where the Hashemite government will come out on top, or whether it will be deposed, is a question. We can be assured that the Western governments, the United States, and obviously Great Britain, would prefer the Hashemite government to continue, and would likely back them. But if you had another left-wing president, uh, such as Barack Obama, or a weak president like Jimmy Carter, we don't know what would actually happen. What we do know is those prophecies of Isaiah concerning a man must still take place. What else is transpiring this week in prophecy? Let's begin to understand it. In Great Britain, the so-called conservative government of Theresa May, who I've warned is a detestable woman, she is a detestable woman, both politically and personally, she is absolutely detestable. She should not be Prime Minister, she was not pro-Brexit, she is there because of the manipulation of the Tory party establishment, and she almost lost control of the government to Labour, rescued only by the Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland. Elements of her government, bearing in mind that the leader of the Conservative Party in Scotland is a lesbian, proposing new legislation in Parliament that one may choose their gender not on the basis of what they are chromosomally or anatomically, but just by declaring it. You can be a male and say you're a woman, you're a woman, you can say you're a male. Until now, there is a condition that many consider to be a made-up, a manufactured condition called gender diasporia, a psychiatric diagnosis that says someone is a male trapped in a female body or vice versa. A panel of medical experts is required to confirm this diagnosis before someone may make legal application to have their gender changed on their identity. The new legislation proposed by elements of the British Conservative Party, the Conservative Party would amend that and anybody can just declare their gender. In Canada already, parents are declaring the gender of their children, not based on reality, not based on being double X or XY chromosomally, not based on anything other than the option they want to have. Again, the death of reason. Reason itself is suspended. Well, let's press on. The largest IPO initial public offer in history is about to become reality. Can you imagine right now, Apple is the largest corporation in terms of capitalization uh, and may soon reach $1 trillion in its total net value. 
within the next three to five years. Aramaco, being taken public by the government of Saudi Arabia, will be two and a half times that. It, as, as Apple is now, we're talking nearly, we're talking about a two trillion dollar corporation. 95% of the shares will still be retained by the Saudi Arabian government. However, which is basically the House of Saud, that family. However, 5% will be in publicly available shares. There is competition between the London Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange to have it listed. Now, London has agreed to change its rules simply to get it listed in London. In Wall Street, however, there's another factor. If an executive or a group of executives meet to fix prices, that is called a criminal conspiracy. Those executives are liable to indictment and prosecution. Well, that's what OPEC does every time it meets in Vienna. It conspires to fix prices and it's controlled by Saudi Arabia. Having a corporation like that listed on the New York Stock Exchange would be incredible. The Trump administration has just concluded a $350 billion arms deal with the Saudi Arabian government. It may be the largest or certainly one of the largest arms deals ever recorded in history. But a listing of Aramco, the Arabian American oil company, on the New York Stock Exchange would raise a number of legal and ethical questions. What you might have is simply foreign officials from the House of Saud on the board of directors of the corporation who for diplomatic reasons would have immunity from prosecution for what would otherwise be a criminal act. We have seen far too much pandering by Western governments in America, Britain, France, and elsewhere to the Saudi Arabians. But money talks, mammon is the god. Let's continue. The fall of Mosul and now the new attacks on Raqqa are continuing to create a vacuum in northern and central Iraq. As we've warned in our last two broadcasts, the prospect of Iran filling that, rack, uh, that vacuum increases almost by the week. The question becomes, will the Trump administration and the British be willing to begin bombing Iranian targets in Iraq and in Syria once ISIS has been obliterated? Now, ISIS has already been functionally obliterated nearly. Once ISIS is history, uh, and already its members are increasingly defecting to Al-Qaeda or to other partisan groups, <coughs> will the West be willing to use those same weapons, particularly um, air attacks and uh, air, oh, I'm sorry, um, Will they be willing to use the same aerial bombardment against Iran? I certainly hope they would, but something else has begun to emerge this week in prophecy. The Kurdish foreign minister, Mustafa Bakira, held a series of meetings with officials from the Trump administration. They are seeking the backing of the American government for Kurdish independence, for Kurdish independence. This would greatly anger and trouble the Turks because they're afraid of the Turkish uh, independence movement of Kurds within Turkey as there is a large Kurdish population in the neighboring region of Turkey. If there was one in Kurdistan in northern Iraq, Turkey would certainly, certainly not like it. We already have Turkish attacks on American-backed armed factions of Kurds fighting ISIS. Nonetheless, almost much in cinemas again, in any event, the Kurds are very serious. I have said for some time, the Kurds are the only force in Iraq that the United States, the West, or the Israelis can in any degree trust. You cannot trust 
the Sunnis, or the Shias. There's six of one, half dozen of the other. You can play one against the other, but neither are any good, and neither are the friends of the West or of the Judeo-Christian world. Neither. The Kurds are much more moderate as a whole. The problem with Kurdish independence is they would be a landlocked country. And although they do have oil revenue, how would they export it? How would they market it? They certainly couldn't do it through Turkey. At least that would be most unlikely. They're landlocked. They don't have access to a port. There are economic obstacles to Kurdish independence, but the Kurds have rightly had it with both the Sunni regimes and the Shia Islamic re uh, the Shia Islamic parties in Iran, sorry, but they had just about had it with both the Sunni regime and the Shia elements who are aligned with Iran in Iraq. Kurdish independence is a very interesting factor in the overall equation. It could change the nature of things in Iraq and the Middle East as a whole. It might be in the best interest of the United States, of Israel and the West, to support a Turkish state, despite the protests that would inevitably come from the present regime in Turkey. It would be a buffer against Iran, and it would be an alternative to the ordinary Sunni and Shia Arabs, as the Kurds, of course, are not Arabs. Let's move on. There's an intellectual movement in the United States that is now gaining momentum in Israel. It's led by the academic Daniel Pipes, and he is responding to efforts to delegitimize Israel by the Islamic world, well-funded with petrodollars, of course, demonize Israel, and then seek to delegitimize it. The reaction that Mr. Pipes and others, including Melanie Phillips, the British journalist, are advocating, that has now been taken up by the Israeli Knesset, would seek to force any negotiations with the Palestinian Authority to acquiesce to the fact that they were defeated militarily and Israel was the victor, and they cannot continue to engender aspirations of the delegitimization or revisionism, as if Israel did not win those wars, or any kind of dissolution of, of the Jewish state. It's interesting that this began with Daniel Pice in the United States. We've recommended his website multiple times. You cannot rely on governments to tell the truth, but Daniel Pipes has been fair and accurate consistently. Let's press on to the United States. We've said a number of times there is no such thing as moderate Islam. That's a myth. It's a lie. What there are, however, are moderate Muslims. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, that's not radical Islam, that's just Islam. They take it literally. But there are moderate Muslims who don't take it so literally. The comparison has been made with Roman Catholicism. <coughs> the official position of the Roman Catholic Church is one where birth control is outlawed, forbidden even for married people. However, most Catholics, between 70 and 90 percent, reject this, even though it's an official doctrine of the Catholic Church. Well, moderate Muslims are like those Catholics who don't accept all the teachings of, of Rome or the papacy. No, there's no such thing as moderate Islam, but there are moderate Muslims. One of which is running for local office near Denver, Colorado. His name is P.K. Kaiser. He's an American citizen of Asian descent, and he warned in a magazine article about the growth of Islamism in America in a publication called the Aurora Sentinel. He specifically named a local radical Islamic cleric, Karim Abu Zaid, who has made statements in support of Islamic extremism.
He's come under substantial attack being accused of Islamophobia. He's come under attack saying that he is taking this position to advance his own political interests. One of the things we have seen in Britain, and we are now beginning to see in America, is this. A concentrated effort to marginalize, censor, and silence moderate Muslims. In Britain, that is already the case. This week in prophecy in California, Imam Ammar Shaheen delivered a sermon with a prayer asking the God Allah to annihilate the Jews and to help them to do it. And when that war breaks, that they would run and hide. Those, just some of the recent words out of a Davis mosque, a Davis imam, now striking at the heart of Muslims who feel misunderstood and Jews who say they've been targeted with hate. It will say all Muslim, it will not say all Palestinian. The sermon delivered by Imam Amar Shaheen is one of thousands monitored by the D.C.-based bipartisan Middle East Media Research Institute over the last 19 years. Stephen Stilinski directs the nonprofit and spoke to Fox 40 tonight by phone. Here's what he says. His translators discovered the Imam preached in Arabic and in some English. He made a, a statement talking about annihilating the Jews and um, liberating Al Aqsa Mosque and other other things in there. I mean, it's in his words. Um, there's nothing we translated that was mistranslated or put out of context. That's a common thing that uh, when people are caught saying something in Arabic um, that they did not want to be caught saying, that's what they say. And when the president of the Islamic Center of Davis stepped out of his mosque late Tuesday evening, his defense of Imam Shaheen did fall along those lines. The excerpts don't explain the full context of the Friday sermon itself. And those uh, words were in fact directed at oppressors, so Israeli regimes that are oppressing Palestinians, not at Jews generally. So your description of what was said is that the Imam was speaking specifically about the situation that's going with the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the oppression of those particular Israelis in his view there, not Jews in general. Yes, uh, that is absolutely correct. The city of Davis is known for its tolerance. Where do things go from here now that one of its houses of worship, one of its faith leaders, has been accused of spewing hate? Our community is known to have strong ties with the Jewish community, and this is something we pride ourselves with. And to have that uh, be tested and to have that be questioned is actually very stressful for us. It's been a rough couple of days because we want to get across that we do not have this animosity. Now again, if a Christian said this about Muslims, it would be considered hate speech. Why should this Muslim be allowed to get rid of it? Why does the United States or any Western country give visas to Islamic clergymen like this to enter the United States? Screening should not just be about known association with terrorist organizations, but with their ideology. This man should not be tolerated in America. But the liberal establishment in California are short of a number of things. One is money because they push the state into virtual insolvency. And the other thing they're short on is brains. What do you expect from California? Well, let's move on. Back to the Middle East this week in prophecy. Mahmoud Abbas, leader of the Palestinian Authority, in league with the Palestinian Legislative Council, have established a new law uh, governing social media. It is their cyber control law. That if anyone within their jurisdiction, that is the West Bank, says anything that they disapprove of, they'll be subject to arrest and criminal prosecution. Anti-free speech, anti-democracy, and if you post anything on Facebook or social media they disapprove of, you're subject to arrest and prosecution. Again, how can America or Europe or the Israelis negotiate with people like this when they are fundamentally anti-democratic and averse to our values of free speech? Now, this is not only the Palestinian Authority. We see this now taking place on the campuses of America. 
He attempts to silence conservative speakers, using violence to prevent them from speaking. They're anti-free speech. They're anti-democracy. This increases when we give visas to students from Islamic countries. There have been multiple claims and reports recently by exiled Christians or Christian refugees who fled Iran because of Islamic persecution that the Iranian guard, Islamic fanatics, are now sending people under the guise of student visas to the United States and the West. Their first targets are going to be Christian refugees from the Arab countries. That's why they're being sent, if these reports are true. This shows that Mr. Trump's well-intentioned designs to restrict immigration from these countries is not good enough. There must be a restriction of immigration of Muslims from all Muslim countries, except for those we know who have collaborated with the West in the war against terror, such as interpreters and so forth. Student visas should not be given to students from Islamic countries anymore. We do not know or have a way to screen if they are on it. We do know that there's an increase in radical Islamic activism by foreign students in American universities who our own government has given student visas to enter America who should not have received. Universities are run as businesses and foreign students will often pay a lot of money or be subsidized to come to American universities making substantial profits. But there's also considerable funding coming from Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states into Islamic studies departments and other programs furthering the Islamic agenda on American universities. We've warned about this in the past, but this is the first time there is a concern about Iranian revolutionary guards coming to the West, not directly from Iran necessarily, although some may, but their surrogates, Shia Muslims from surrounding Arab countries. Let's continue. Very interesting discovery this week in an article published in the American Journal of Human Genetics. We warned a number of years ago, we predicted a number of years ago, genetic technology will become good enough to get a DNA signature from hard tissue like bone in some cases even though the bone tissue may be hundreds or even thousands of years old. I predicted that this would happen, and I said it could be one way how the 12 tribes of Israel in Revelation 7 and 14 can be genetically identified. If you've got enough DNA signatures from enough bone of enough Hebrew burial sites in each of the tribal areas of Israel, Bearing in mind, the 12 tribes are not just tribes, but, as it were, provinces. If you got enough definition for those signatures and matched it with the DNA of Jews today, <coughs> you have a very good idea what tribes they came from. Considerable advances have already taken place in this area for Jews with names like Levy, Levinsky, uh, Levinson, Cohen, Siegel, Levitical names by those interested in resurrecting the Iranic priesthood. But this week in Prophecy, the Journal of Human Genetics in the United States published an article concerning the remains of five skeletons excavated near the city of Sedan in Lebanon. They were able to retrieve adequate genetic signatures from that hard tissue and compare it with 99 Lebanese Arabs. And they found that these ancient Canaanite bones show that the ancient Canaanites were the ancestors of the majority of the people living in Lebanon 
based on the probabilities of the 99 Lebanese they did contrast with. Well, that would be very, very interesting. It would be very interesting indeed, anthropologically and theologically. It would show that it's not just the sons of Esau who are the Arabs opposing Israel. And it would not show that the Persians, as per Daniel 10, were opposing Israel. It would raise the prospect of Hezbollah, the Canaanites, the ancient enemies going back to the time of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joshua at the conquest. Again, very little attention given to this in the mass media. Nonetheless, anthropologically and theologically, a significant point to bear in mind and to watch carefully. The Temple Mount. As we spoke of last week, for the first time in 2,000 years, and this week I've been able to confirm that is a probable reality, for the first time in two millennia, a minyan, an official Jewish prayer service, took place on the Temple Mount when Muslims in protest refused to go onto the Temple Mount due to the installation of metal detection equipment. Orthodox Jews are, again, disallowed from going up there by halakha, by rabbinic law, unless they're going up to rebuild the Temple. Hence, the Jews who went up there and held the Minyan must have ascended for that reason. The reason, of course, Orthodox Jews are not allowed up there is because, having rejected Yeshua as the Messiah, they do not believe that the Shekinah is in the hearts of those who are born again, but they think the Shekinah is still up on the Temple Mount where the Holy of Holies used to be. Hence, the restriction of going up there unless you are ascending it to rebuild, and that happened. However, the Israelis, under international pressure, apparently some of it from the American State Department, pandering to the Jordanians, probably. Again, bearing in mind that King Abdullah's position is more precarious than the State Department will state publicly, for obvious reasons. The Israelis have agreed to withdraw, withdraw or remove the metal detectors. They're going to attempt to replace them with some kind of other thermal imaging. The entire notion that radical Muslims have a right to smuggle weapons onto the Temple Mount so they can murder people is ridiculous, but that's the right they claim. This was a national humiliation. Whenever you make such a concession, the fundamentalist Muslims, they count it as a victory in the jihad. Their way of thinking and their conditioning is so ridiculous that if Pakistan were to win a cricket game against England, they would see that in terms of jihad. They would see that in terms of Allah giving them victory over the infidel even in a cricket game, a sport. No concession can ever be made to fundamentalist Muslims. Camp David was negotiated with Anwar Sadat, the secular Arab. Hosni Mubarak, King Abdullah. But with religious Muslims who control the law, it was a big mistake. But the Israelis may have been coerced into it and had their arms twisted. It was not a good thing. At the same time this week, the Israeli Knesset passed a new law raising the bar for any negotiation on the future of Jerusalem. That any change in its status as the United City, the eternal Jewish capital, would now require 80 of the 120 members of the Knesset to vote for it. The Israelis are holding on tighter as the Muslims attempt to delegitimize, making more and more and more demands. So it goes. Meanwhile, in London, England, the Islamic Cooperation Council, also known as the OIC, 
funded by Saudi Arabia, have launched a campaign to make demands of the British and other Western, particularly European governments, to make any criticism of Islam a violation of a blasphemy. That if you were to point out things that they found offensive, even quoting from the Quran, things that Mohammed said and did, it could be considered a hate crime and be prosecutable. The precedent for this was set in Victoria State in Australia several years ago. Fortunately, the law was reversed following a brutal, brutal court battle in which former Muslims who became Christians were criminally prosecuted for simply quoting the teachings of Muhammad and were retaliated against by Muslim clergymen who said that they offended Islam, even though all they did was quote what Muhammad said. Left-wing judge sided with the Muslims. I would love to see a West-wing, West, a left, I'm sorry. I would love to see a left-wing judge like that appear in an Islamic court and face Islamic justice. Since he's lost his mind already, it wouldn't mean anything if he lost his head. I don't wish that on him, but that's how absurd it was in Australia. Yet now funded by Saudi Arabia, that is indeed what they are pushing. It's coming increasingly. Let's move on. <coughs> <coughs> Justina Greeling, the education minister of Theresa May's government in Britain, is now demanding a change in British law, mandating that the Church of England, mandating the Church of England, change its position and be compelled to perform same-sex marriages. When same-sex marriages and the like were first ratified by Parliament, the proviso and condition was churches, religious institutions, would be immune from the requirement to perform marriage ceremonies that were in conflict with their religious values. Now the so-called Tory government of Theresa May this horrible Justina Greenwood are saying the church must bring its teaching, its praxis into line with contemporary values. They didn't say that when they first got the law in. Now we talk about this on our teaching on Daniel 3 and 6. We predicted this would happen. First to get a law on the books, and then they would expand it once they got their foot in the door. Did make you think it was innocuous? It was not going to affect Christian rights? It does. As we spoke about, the same Ministry of Education is now seeking action against a Orthodox Jewish school for refusing to teach the same-sex curriculum mandated in state schools by the British government. These are the Tories. The only hope is that God will raise his hand against Theresa May and that the Democratic Unionist Party that has a Christian constituency and without whom the Tory government cannot stand and retain power will exert its muscle. Let us pray that they do so. Finally, to the surprise of many people, including myself, Mr. Trump, after consultation with military and medical experts, has reversed the Obama administration's position on transgenders in the military. It was a bad policy because it made the entire army uh, and the entire military change its policies to 
basically fit the needs of a very small contingent of people who unfortunately suffer from severe mental illness. Suddenly you have women who are expected to shower with men who say they are women. The military is expected to cover the cost of transgender surgery and hormone replacement and all the rest of it. You know, that's something that has nothing to do with military readiness. And unlike race, which has no impact on military readiness and ability to serve, mental illness has always been a 4F issue. If you, if you, you don't have a right to serve in the army. No one has the right to serve in the army. And listen, this is not a rip on the patriotic transgender people who want to serve in the army. I mean, that's an amazing thing and good for them. They're, they're making a sacrifice that I was not willing to make. So I have nothing but praise for them. But that does not mean that the army, that the military has a responsibility to take in people who it thinks are going to harm unit cohesion, destroy the ability of people to get along in small areas uh, under lots of pressure, and the ability of the military to actually take a look at the mental status of the people who are attempting to enter. Like, there are lots of people who want to enter the military who are really out of shape, and I'm sure the military turns them away as well, right? If you have flat feet, you can be 4F. So then the military has lots of standards. If you can't meet those standards, and it seems to me definitionally, if you're a man who thinks he's a woman, you have a mental illness that it's going to be difficult for you to serve in the military uh, at, at the at the level that the military would expect you to. It, it creates all sorts of issues. It also creates standards issues. So let's say that you're a guy who's trying out for the military, but you're transgender now. So are you expected to fulfill the female requirements or the male requirements? Because there are two different requirements for women who are trying out for the military versus men. It's not the same standard. This is always the question about women serving in combat positions. Did they have to fulfill the same rigorous physical standards as a man, right? If you want a woman to be a Navy SEAL, are you going to have a lowered standard for her to become a Navy SEAL? How about a man who says he's a woman? Now can he get the female standard so that's an issue. People who have served on the front lines, I, I have yet to meet a soldier who serves on the front lines who thinks that unit cohesion will not be harmed by the inclusion of transgender soldiers in, uh, on the front lines, in battle areas, in combat areas. And so, in, in any case, President Trump is right on the policy, but how he rolled it out, I think, is really not appropriate. So he goes on Twitter, and as a, I, I think this is all a distraction from Sessions, because within five minutes he's treating about Sessions again. He said, after consultation with my generals and military experts, please be advised that the U.S. government will not accept or allow transgender individuals to serve in any capacity in the U.S. military. Our military must be focused on decisive and overwhelming victory and cannot be burdened with the tremendous medical costs and disruption that transgender in the military would entail. Thank you. He's making the right move and using the right strategy. I have argued and contended the only way to oppose these things, these trends, is based on medical and scientific argumentation. The same with abortion. The arguments must be based on science and clinical reality. Also on practical economics. The cost of having transgenders in the military is exorbitant. Uh, why should the taxpayer be forced to foot, foot the bill for something of this nature? I applaud what Mr. Trump did. Please pray for him. Predictably, the chorus of liberal Democrats, led by Nancy Pelosi, supposed Roman Catholic, whose religion supposedly opposes such things, has led, again, the predictable chorus of protest. Well done, Mr. Trump. You got it right this time. Arguments against same-sex marriage must take the same line. Transgenderism, the suicide rate among those people, that has to be argued for from the position of psychiatric medicine. That's the only way you're going to oppose it. Reduce longevity of homosexuals. That's the only way you're going to oppose it. You make them argue with medical science. They're never going to accept Judeo-Christian moral values. But medical science packs more punch. To the point where they're now saying medical science has to be ignored. Somebody can declare themselves a male or a female, even though chromosomally they may be the opposite, and anatomically they may be the opposite. So they've already rejected biblical values. Now they're trying to reject scientific and medical reality. That's going to be a more difficult task for these people. Again, continue to pray for Mr. Trump and his administration. He's not my favorite, but he's better than the alternative, and we must pray for him. This is Jacob Prash coming to you from Brisbane, Australia. That has been This Week in Prophecy. God bless and thank you for listening. Jesus is indeed coming soon.